Good evening and welcome to the 2020 Tom Brock Lecture. My name's Terry Williams. I'll be your MC for this evening's very special event. May I start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. We pay our respects to their elders past and present. Very special event tonight. As I said, Tom Brock, the man uh, whose name adorns this event, was South Sydney royalty, one of the greats of the club and certainly a great rugby league scholar. When he died in 1997, he bequeathed his estate to further the academic study of rugby league. And uh, the first lecture was held in 1998, this year being the 22nd uh, annual lecture. Very different event, as I said tonight, because we've got to do it via Zoom, but I'm sure it'll be uh, just as worthwhile as the other 21 uh, and certainly something very exciting. Just on the format for this evening, uh, the hashtag for this evening's event is TomBrock22. Uh, we're going to have Joe Gorman speak in uh, very shortly. Um, after that, there's going to be a panel discussion with a couple of very special guests where I'll ask them some questions from a New South Wales perspective, and we'll bring Joe in on that too, hopefully. Uh, and then if you'd like to submit your questions during the event, uh, you're able to do so. There's a Q&A bottom button at the bottom of your screen. So if you want to get, uh, get uh, some questions to us, um, we'll uh, be able to take them that way. Um, without any further ado, Joe Gorman is an acknowledged um, journalist. He's an award-winning author. His book, um, Heartland, How Queensland Explains Rugby League, uh, has been very well received, not just north of the border. I'm sure it's going to be a great pleasure to hear from him. His uh, lecture for tonight's event is State of Origin, 40 Years, How uh, Past, Present and Future. And uh, I'm sure it's going to traverse some very interesting territory. So without any further ado, over to Joe. Hi, everyone, and welcome to another Tom Brock Lecture. I'm coming to you from Cairns in far north Queensland, so as you can imagine, we're all pretty happy up here after Game 1. It was, in many ways, a perfect opening to the 40th iteration of State of Origin. As always, New South Wales went in overhyped by a cocky, born-to-rule Sydney media who were now ready to crucify their young stars if they lose Game 2. Meanwhile, Queensland played the underdog role to perfection. The performances of those rookie players, in particular Kurt Capewell and AJ Brimson, proved once again that the flame still burns in a new generation of Queenslanders. For me, Origin has always been a road back to my home state. I was born in the front room of an old Queenslander house in Brisbane, and although I now live in Cairns, I actually spent most of my life in New South Wales. All of my family, though, are born in Queensland, and it was rugby league in particular that reaffirmed this feeling. We followed the Maroons and the Broncos, and my old man, who is a poet, dedicated one of his books to Steve Reynolds' famous try for the Broncos in the 1992 Grand Final. The picture you're seeing here is of me, aged maybe eight or nine, doing my best little Alfie Langer impersonation in my New South Wales backyard. Part of the reason I wrote my book, Heartland, How Rugby League Explains Queensland, was to try and make sense of this powerful Queensland identity. Why did I connect so strongly to my state of origin rather than my state of residence? I think part of the answer lies in something that Queensland's rookie prop, Lindsay Collins, spoke about in the promo for the Channel 9 broadcast on Wednesday night. He said that while he couldn't recall watching much origin, sorry, watching much football growing up, he did remember those Wednesday nights watching Origin. And therein lies the key to it all. For Queenslanders, especially of my generation, Origin is often the entry point to following rugby league. Yes, we may also follow the Broncos or the Cowboys or the Titans or even a club in Sydney, but the Maroons are the catalyst. I reckon it is almost unique in world sport for a regional representative team to have so much more meaning than clubs and national sides, but this is just part of what makes Queensland different. To properly understand State of Origin, we must first revisit the old interstate series, and in particular, the dominance of New South Wales in the 1970s. The story begins, believe it or not, with Queensland's former Premier, Joe Bjorki peterson Bjorki peterson was a peanut farmer who left school aged 13, joined the National Party and was elected Premier in 1968. He drew his support primarily from country Queensland, exploiting a gerrymandered electoral system that allowed the votes of rural electorates to be worth up to five times more than those in the city. No Australian politician would ever harness the twin forces of conservatism and parochialism as effectively as the man they called the hillbilly dictator. Bjorki Peterson's enthusiasm for hectoring New South Wales and Victoria, and especially Canberra, almost matched his strident anti-communism. 
During the 1970s, he began openly canvassing the possibility of Queensland secession, telling a Japanese trade mission, we are not Australians, we are Queenslanders. He was also, in the words of Gough Whitlam, a Bible-bashing bastard, a devout Lutheran who hated gambling, under Bjorki Peterson's watch, poker machines were banned in Queensland. This decision had a decisive impact on rugby league, as Queensland clubs were forced to survive on gate takings and relatively meagre sponsorship. Meanwhile, in New South Wales, where the ban on poker machines had been lifted in 1956, Sydney clubs were better able to raise revenue and buy players from interstate. The players that left Queensland for Sydney, guys like Kerry Bostead, Rod Reddy, John Lang, John Rebo and Arthur Beetson, would then be selected for New South Wales rather than for Queensland, and on many occasions they were decisive in helping the Blues beat their home state. This wealth and power imbalance in rugby league, wrote Queensland historian Max Howe, was seen as a microcosm of what had happened to the state politically. Not only had Southerners squirreled away Queensland's wealth, now they were stealing their best footballers as well. In 1980, New South Wales won the first two games of the Interstate Series to claim its 20th series victory in as many years, yet fewer than 2,000 supporters were there at Leichhardt Oval to witness the occasion. Even if the Interstate Series was not yet officially dead, it was certainly no longer worth watching. According to one reporter, the match was as miserable as the conditions, and anyone who paid money to get into the ground after half-time should apply for a refund. The problem was with the eligibility rules for the Interstate Series, which had been designed at a time when the best players mostly lived in and played for the state in which they were born. During the 1920s, for example, Queensland won four consecutive series with players drawn from the local competitions of Brisbane, Ipswich and Toowoomba. Clearly, by the 1970s, this was no longer the case. Queenslanders were tired of losing their best players to New South Wales and knew that unless something drastic occurred, the Blues would continue winning. One solution that had been percolating in the minds of Queenslanders for decades was state of origin. As early as 1964, a former kangaroo turned journalist, Jack Reardon, had called for players to be selected on the basis of their state of origin, rather than the, the state in which they played club footy. The suggestion, according to one historian, was laughed out by league officials. Yet by the late 1970s, there was a ready-made example of how a state of origin contest might work. In Australian rules football, an underdog Western Australia side had repatriated several of their Victorian-based players and defeated um, Victoria at Subiaco Oval in Perth. One of the men involved in the Australian rules state of origin match was Barry Maranta, a Brisbane businessman who would later establish the Brisbane Broncos. As a Queenslander, Maranta had felt a state of origin clash would apply equally as well in rugby league. After all, the rivalry and the power imbalance between Western Australia and Victoria was similar to that between Queensland and New South Wales. Contrary to popular legend, Maranta actually recalls some initial resistance to state of origin from the chairman of the QRL, Senator Ron McAuliffe. McAuliffe didn't just want Queensland to level with New South Wales in the interstate series, he wanted the Brisbane Rugby League to, to rival the Sydney competition. Granting expatriate Queenslanders a maroon jersey, he felt, would only serve as a green light for others to move south, which in turn would hasten the decline of Brisbane clubs and the league as a whole. Yet the Senator gradually came around. In 1979, Hugh Lunn, a journalist and rugby league fan, had sat beside McAuliffe during a flight to Canberra. When McAuliffe expressed his reluctance to hand over a maroon jersey to what he called an ex-Queenslander, Lunn responded, There's no such thing as an ex-Queenslander, Ron. They're like Catholics. There's only ever lapsed Queenslanders. On Wednesday 28th of May 1980, Senator McAuliffe emerged from a meeting of the ARL with historic news. Instead of a third interstate match, a state of origin exhibition game would be held at Lang Park in Brisbane, with Queensland free to select their strongest side. It's a promoter's dream, he told reporters. Many people in Sydney, though, sneered at the new format. In a Daily Mirror poll of 100 first grade players, 54% voted against the introduction of state of origin. Bob Fulton, a former New South Wales captain, called it a lollipop match and predicted that it would be the non-event of the century. Sports broadcaster Ron Casey wrote, To the Queensland hillbillies in Premier Joe's Banana Land, the state of origin match might be a big deal, but to those in the land of the living, here in Sydney, it's just another match without much meaning. 
For many Queenslanders though, State of Origin represented the last hope to restore state pride. Virtually without exception, the expatriate Queenslanders are eagerly awaiting the opportunity to represent their home state, observed John McCoy, a lead caller for Brisbane radio station 4BC. The keenest of these expatriate Queenslanders was of course Arthur Beetson, who at 35 years of age had achieved almost every career milestone possible. He had yet to lose an interstate series while playing for New South Wales, and on several occasions he had skippered the Blues to victory, but he had not yet pulled on the maroon jumper of his home state. In June 1980, Beetson had told reporters that playing for Queensland was top of the list of his remaining ambitions. If chosen, he said, it would be one of the biggest thrills of my career. I would consider it a great honour. Beetson was named captain of a Queensland side that featured seven expatriate Queenslanders and six residents. In front of a heaving crowd of more than 30,000 people at Lang Park, Big Artie led Queensland to a famous 10-point victory. It was the Maroons' first win over the Blues in five years. Beetson seemed to be involved in everything, tackling ferociously, trading blows with the New South Wales forwards, niggling in the ruck, playing a part in the build-up to both tries, even attempting a grubber kick from inside his own half. He also famously stiff-armed his Parramatta teammate Mick Cronin, which instantly gave legitimacy to the state of origin concept. At that point, state against state, mate against mate, was born. Indeed, as the story of Beetson's stiff arm on Cronin got better and more extravagant in the telling, it became a kind of creation myth for the Queensland Rugby League fraternity and for the revamped Interstate Series. Dr Chris Sara, who recently served as a commissioner for the ARL, remembers watching that game as a child in Bundaberg. It was like the image of a sperm impregnating an egg, Dr Sara once told me. When Arthur punched Mick Cronin, that was the conception of state of origin. Something happened in that moment and the universe was forever changed because of it. Forty years on and it is easy to take State of Origin for granted and many fans of my generation would know nothing of the old interstate series. There is no doubt that Origin fundamentally changed the course of the professional game here in Australia. More than one journalist has since described it as the monster that ate rugby league. In my view, Origin has had three major impacts on the game. The first is on the field. Origin increased the quality of the interstate matches and reoriented the focus of representative football to state rather than nation. The second is economic. Origin took rugby league to new audiences, boosted TV numbers and became a commercial juggernaut for the game. And the third is cultural. Origin was the catalyst for a rugby league renaissance in Queensland. For decades, the three game series has been the major cultural event of the calendar up here in the Sunshine State. Now there will not be time to provide a blow-by-blow -blow account of State of Origin, but for the next 15 minutes or so I want to expand on each of these points. First to on-field matters. By 1985, Queensland had won 8 out of a possible 11 Origin matches and 3 consecutive series. In the 1985 series, however, New South Wales won 2 games to 1, including a famous victory in Brisbane. The images of a triumphant Blues captain Steve Mortimer falling to the Lang Park turf in Game 1 and being shared from the Sydney cricket ground in Game 2 have come to symbolise a renewed New South Wales pride. That win, Mortimer told reporters after Game 2, was the proudest moment of my life. Brian Mossop, writing in Sydney's Daily Telegraph, observed that year how State of Origin clashes had come to rival Kangaroos matches for interest. Lang Park on Origin night, wrote Mossop, was not so much a playground but a battlefield. The language of war was now increasingly being used by journalists, players and officials to describe origin. According to Mike Gibson, then host of Channel 9's Wide World Sports, the network made a conscious decision to market the series as World War III, state against state, mate against mate, rockets, cannons, bullets and bayonets. When Blues hardman Les Boyd infamously broke Daryl Broman's jaw in Game 1 of 1983, there was a chorus of condemnation from pundits, yet Channel 9 replayed that footage over and over again. As Mike Gibson once recalled, we watched, we saw Broman's jaw smashed on Wide World of Sports more times than we watched Torval and Dean skate Bolero. The animosity soon infiltrated the Kangaroos. Before Game 3 of the 1985 series, the coach of the Kangaroos, Terry Fernley, 
who was also the coach of New South Wales, infamously dropped four Queenslanders for the upcoming test match against New Zealand. The controversial decision, which was interpreted by one Brisbane reporter as an interstate slur, was the biggest flashpoint of a particularly unhinged season, a year in which bitter infighting broke out between the two states and the national interest was sacrificed at the altar of state of origin. QRL chairman Ron McAuliffe in particular went troppo. He described Fernley's call as a football assassination and likened it to civil war happening in the Middle East. What has been happening in Beirut, he raged, is nothing compared to what happened to Queensland players in Auckland. Fernley, for his part, stated that Wally Lewis and his fellow Queenslanders seemed more concerned with winning state of origin than they did about playing for their country. The ARL, meanwhile, brought in the Terry Fernley rule to prevent any coach simultaneously holding both state and national jobs. What I'm really trying to get at here is that the events of 1985 proved that the interstate matches were now important enough to seriously disrupt national unity. The focus of Australian Rugby League was now oriented towards a regional rivalry rather than international representative honours. And that's the way it has basically been ever since. There has been long, long been talk of lingering tensions between the New South Welshmen and the Queenslanders in the Australian side, while fans have virtually lost interest in the Kangaroos. There is money to be made from such an explosive interstate rivalry, however, and State of Origin soon became an economic powerhouse for Australian Rugby League. In Game 2 of the 1985 series, for example, nearly 40,000 people showed up at the SCG to witness the Blues take out the series, a staggering increase on the Sydney crowds at the old interstate matches. Between 1986 and 89, Sydney attendances for Origin matches grew to a level where they were either on par or greater than those in Brisbane. And in 1990, Game 2 of the series was taken to Melbourne, where tickets sold out two weeks in advance. It was the first time that Origin had been used as a missionary tool by the ARL to expand rugby league into new areas, and when it returned to Melbourne four years later, in 1994, nearly 90,000 people turned up to the MCG in what was one of the biggest sporting crowds that year, and a record for Origin. John Quayle, the ARL chief executive at the time, believed television played a vital role in helping convert Victorians to state of origin and then to rugby league. Indeed, from the very beginning, in, from the very beginning origin was almost a perfect made-for-TV event. As media scholar Brett Hutchins has written, the period 1989 to 95 saw origin consolidate its position as a major national sporting event, creating large national and international television audiences. The Super League war fractured that momentum for a time, but by the new millennium, Origin was re rebuilding as a television spectacle. In 2006, audiences for Games 1 and 3 cracked the 2 million mark, and by 2008, Origin was the most popular program of the year. Those numbers, of course, drew sponsors and advertisers like Moths to a Flame. Part of the reason for this is the sheer competitiveness of the series, which lends itself to a highly engaged audience year after year. But even after 2006, as Queensland began to dominate in a way that had not been seen before and perhaps may never be seen again, Origin's popularity remained undiminished. In 2013, as the Maroons clinched its eighth consecutive series, all records were broken as the three-game series was attended by more than 200,000 fans and watched by a cumulative audience of almost 12 million. Which brings me to my third point. From the very beginning, Queensland has owned the narrative arc of State of Origin. Even when we are winning, Queensland somehow manages to hold on to that underdog status. Brisbane journalist Adrian McGregor once described the formula of Origin this way. New South Wales proudly defends its traditional status as a senior state, while Queensland challenges with an underdog, chip on the shoulder resentment. Likewise, Steve Mascord has observed that Queensland are the Harlem Globetrotters of Origin, while New South Wales are the Washington Generals the team which is simply there to provide an opposition. One of the forgotten legacies of State of Origin is that it dramatically increased the number of Queenslanders in the Kangaroos. During the 1970s, Queenslanders barely got a look in, and when they did, they were often seen as tokens, only there because of interstate selection politics. Yet by 1986, Origin had helped Wally Lewis become the first Queenslander to captain a kangaroo side since Tom Gorman in 1929, and by the end of the 1980s, there were 12 Queenslanders in the 20-man squad that toured New Zealand. 
My father likes to tell a story of travelling in New York in the early 90s, in the days before the internet, where he spent half a day searching frantically for an Australian newspaper to see whether Alan Langer got selected at halfback for the Kangaroos, ahead of Ricky Stewart. All that has changed now, of course, to the point where Queenslanders can reasonably expect to claim at least 50% of the squad. In the 2017 Rugby League World Cup final between Australia and England, for example, the Kangaroos side featured nine Queenslanders, including a Queensland captain and an all-Queensland spine. In my book, I try to explain the enormous cultural significance that Rugby League, and in particular State of Origin, has assumed in Queensland. Up here, Origin is the Big Bang, the catalyst for a Queenslander revival on and off the field. No other sporting event galvanises and reflects the state of Queensland quite like Origin. It has become something of a secular religion, an annual event that even non-rugby league followers pay heed to. The series allows Queenslanders to reaffirm an idea we have of ourselves as a people and as a geographic entity. Not only do the, kangar- to the, sorry, the Maroons reflect Queensland, but we, it also helps to create Queenslanders. And I'm not just talking about Greg Inglis. For many migrants that have moved to the Sunshine State, adopting the Maroons has become a crucial rite of passage and proof of their assimilation. And for Queenslanders who live interstate, as I did, it is a link back to family and identity. The game also helps to smooth over many of the differences and tensions that exist up here, including the relation between city and country, north and south, black and white. The Maroons at various times have been figureheads for the state during times of flood, drought and cyclone. In recent years, much of that has been thanks to the ambassadorial work of Mal Meninga, who deliberately harnessed the forces of history and geography and storytelling in an effort to motivate his players. When you're having success, Mal once told me, you've got to find a why, you've got to find a purpose. For Queenslanders of Mal's generation, beating New South Wales is still payback for the events of the 1970s. A friend of mine who works in the sugar mill in Tully told me that after a particularly convincing Queensland victory in 2008, he turned to his mate and said, well, that's made up for losing in 1973. And his mate responded, bloody oath it has. Those defeats to New South Wales in the 1970s left a deep emotional scar on so many Queensland rugby league fans. I still remember what it feels like to be broken hearted, Dr. Chris Sara once told me. Even if I'm on the rugby league commission and we've won 25 years in a row, I don't don't care. I still know what it felt like. For a younger generation of Queenslanders, though, beating the Blues has been replaced by a a pride in the ritual of origin. Queensland players no longer speak with venom about their opposition. They speak about wanting to play for their family and for their hometown. State of origin is about upholding a legacy, about affirming the passion for that special maroon jumper, and about making their fellow Queenslanders proud. If the Maroons do manage to hold on and win this year, it will surely go down as one of the greatest series on record. Not since 1995, during the time of Super League, has there been a more disrupted build-up to origin. The Maroons are trying to overcome Queensland's worst ever NRL season, injuries to several players, including David Fafita and Kalen Ponga, the late withdrawal of coach Kevin Walters, and the inexperience of their young squad. The Blues, meanwhile, do have the cattle to create their own dynasty. Interestingly, when I interviewed Wally Lewis in 2018, he wondered whether a new generation of Queensland, sorry, New South Wales kids would arise to avenge the humiliation of the previous decade. For many of the young stars emerging under Brad Fittler, that appears to be the case. Guys like Nathan Cleary, Josh Adokar, James Tedesco and the Trevojevic brothers would have grown up watching Queensland win year after year, just as Queensland's golden generation of Wally, Mal, Choppy Close and Fatty Vorton watched New South Wales dominate the series in the 1970s. And this constant regeneration is part of State of Origin's ongoing appeal. For decades now, people have been predicting the demise of Origin, and for decades the series has been kept alive by a magic moment or a new cast of characters. Above all else though, the great legacy of Origin is that it took from the rich, in this case New South Wales, and gave to the poor in Queensland. That simple equation has gone a long way to sustaining Australian Rugby League over the past four decades. It is also something that we might learn from as we plan for the next 40 years. Before I conclude and hand over to the the panel, I'd like to make one last point about State of Origin and its future. 
For some time now, rugby league has witnessed the rise of new identities and new understandings of the meaning of origin. The women's state of origin, which was consecrated by a Vanessa Foliaki Karina Brown kiss rather than an Artie Pe- beats and punch on Mick Cronin, is one such example. The Indigenous All-Stars, which began in 2010, is another. But the most powerful shift, which we saw so colourfully displayed at the 2017 World Cup, is the Pacific Revolution. Andrew Fafita is at the vanguard of this movement. In 2017 alone, the big prop forward pulled on an incredible five jerseys. Indigenous All-Stars in February, Cronulla Sharks during the NRL season, New South Wales State of Origin time, Griffith three ways in the Curry knockout in October, and finally Tonga in the World Cup in November. His defection from Australia to Tonga made the most headlines. Here was an Indigenous man sacrificing his green and gold jumper and the likelihood of a World Cup victory to represent his father's nation of origin. He was joined by Jason Tamalolo, who, who turned his back on New Zealand to play for Tonga. Both men, to my mind, will be remembered as modern-day Artie Beatsons. Tonga, which is home to just over a thousand pe- sorry, 100,000 people, ended up being the story of the tournament. They beat Samoa, New Zealand and Scotland in the group stage, got past Lebanon in the quarterfinals, before bowing out to England in the semis. Go back and watch those pre-game war cries between Tom- Tonga and Samoa in Christchurch, or the beautiful hymns of the Fijians ahead of their famous win over New Zealand in Wellington. There is something very powerful brewing in the Pacific. As Steve Mascord wrote at the time, being in Hamilton to witness Tonga beat New Zealand must have been what it was like to be at Lang Park for the first origin clash. Like the birth of state of origin, wrote Mascord, rugby league was countering economic migration and empowering those marginalised by it. In the 1970s, economic migration was Queenslander Artie Beetson moving south from Redcliffe to Balmain in order to further his career as a footballer. For the Tongans, Fijians and Samoans of today, however, economic migration is entire families moving there from their ancestral islands to Australia or New Zealand in search of work opportunities. Now there are around 25,000 Australians of Tongan heritage, representing some 25% of Australia's total, sorry, Tonga's total population. The children of those Pacific migrants, guys like Tamalolo, Fafita, Adam Fanua Blake, Will Hopawate, Tony Staggs and Tavita Pangai Jr. are already overrepresented in the NRL. Many of them began their representative careers in the green and gold of Australia or the black of New Zealand, just as Artie Beetson began his in the blue of New South Wales. There is a huge opportunity here for rugby league. Tony Collins, the preeminent scholar of all things rugby league, believes both league and union are becoming sports of the Pacific diaspora. The code which comes to terms with this first and finds a way to unite their nation and their diaspora, he argues, will be the ultimate winner in the Pacific. If that sounds familiar to you, it should. For 40 years, State of Origin has been uniting resident Queenslanders with the diaspora living in Sydney, Canberra or Melbourne. That is literally the genesis of Origin and one of the main reasons the the series has so much emotional resonance up here. Origin shows Queenslanders in the most visceral way that there is indeed no such thing as an ex-Queenslander. In the Pacific, rugby league's great strength in the battle for hearts and minds is a flexible approach to international eligibility. Last year, Marty Tapao defected from New Zealand to Samoa, while Penrith 5'8", Jerome Luai, who was born in Sydney, captain the junior Kiwis, and was this year selected for New South Wales, recently spoke about his desire to lead a Tongan-style revolution for Samoa. The problem for Luai and many other young players, though, is that choosing their ancestral nation outright is still an economic sacrifice. Even despite the pay cuts in State of Origin this year, Luai stands to earn a lot more playing for New South Wales than he does for Samoa. Nobody wants to railroad Pacifica or Melanesian players into choosing their ancestral nation over Australia or New Zealand, just as nobody wants to disrupt the magic of New South Wales versus Queensland. Identity is a complex phenomenon, and rugby league, more than most other sports, must tread very carefully in this space. Currently, players are allowed to play state of origin without disqualifying them from representing a Tier 2 nation such as Tonga, Samoa, Fiji or Papua New Guinea. In other words, Jerome Luai can still play for Samoa at the next Rugby League World Cup, even though he was selected for New South Wales this year. In fact, 10 of the players selected for Queensland and New South Wales this year 
are also eligible for Samoa, while nine more are eligible for either Tonga, Fiji, Papua New Guinea or the Cook Islands. As the number of Pacifica and Melanesian players in the NRL continues to rise, we will almost certainly see more diverse origin squads in future. What happens though if, in 2024, Queensland wins origin with six Samoan Heritage players who then choose to play for Samoa at the World Cup? What happens when the next Wally Lewis, or Alan Langer, or Darren Lockyer, or Jonathan Thurston decides to play for Queensland instead of origin, but Samoa at international level? What happens when half or more of the players chosen for Queensland and New South Wales choose to play for their ancestral nations? Personally, I think that's a brilliant outcome, and for now I sense that most Australians are comfortable with this arrangement, as the Kangaroos are still the dominant force in international rugby league. But the chairman of the QRL, Bruce Hatcher, has raised what I think is a worthwhile objection, saying that it undermines origin to allow players to represent Queensland or New South Wales without committing to Australia. I think the passage of time may prove Hatcher right. I don't know whether your average fan, particularly up here in Queensland, will feel as emotionally invested in a Queensland team that develops players who may one day come back to beat Australia. My first book, The Death and Life of Australian Soccer, published in 2017, was an examination of the impact of immigration on the game and the complicated role of ethnicity in sport. The history of Australian soccer shows us that Anglo-Australians are basically fine with dual identities until we start losing. Once ethnicity becomes a threat to the established order, things often turn pretty feral. Ask yourself this question, do you really think that Queensland or New South Wales fans are going to be happy watching their origin heroes turn around and beat the kangaroos? Of course that day is not yet upon us, but you sense that it might be coming. Tonga have already beaten Australia, and there could be more upsets at the World Cup next year. I, for one, hope so. The worst outcome, to my mind, is for nothing to be done, and for Australia to continue using the financial lure of origin to pillage the Pacific. The big question for Australian Rugby League, then, is how to protect the integrity of state of origin while also supporting the international game. Is there a way in which we can assist those emerging nations so that picking and sticking with Tonga or Samoa is just as enticing and financially rewarding as playing for New South Wales or Queensland. Not every player will choose their ancestral nation. For every Andrew Fafita, there will be a Tyson Frizzell. But the concept and the meaning of origin may one day need to be reframed to accommodate this Pacifica revolution. To me, that sounds like an origin that would better reflect the changing demographics and cultural expectations of rugby league in the 21st century. Thanks very much for tuning in. I'm going to hand over to the panel now to discuss this further and, of course, a lot more. Cheers. Okay, thanks very much, uh, Joe. That was fantastic. Um, I'm going to introduce our two very special guests for the panel this evening. Um, we're very lucky to have Dave Trodden, uh, the Chief Executive of the New South Wales Rugby League, with us. G'day, Dave. G'day, Terry. How are you? Very well, thanks. And joining him, uh, the great Steve blocker Roach, Rugby League Royalty, a man with uh, 20 test matches and 17 origin appearances. A uh, very warm welcome to you too, Steve. Is there somewhere? There he is. G'day, Steve. He needs to be unmuted. Referee's tried it a few times. <laughs> Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. There yeah. You go. How are you going? Yeah, good. Great to for you to join us. Thanks very much for your time, Steve. No, no problem. Uh, good to good to talk to you. That was very okay. interesting, wasn't it? I was wondering when he was going to take a breath. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we might start off, uh, pick up on a couple of points that he made there. Um, certainly, tribalism plays out a bit differently in New South Wales. I think we'd all agree on that. Dave, how do you see that? Uh, yeah, I, I, I agree with that, and, and uh, I just want to compliment Joe as well. You know, he's a um, he's he's a great writer who great, who who brings a, a great perspective to all of these issues. And um, so I've, I've read both his rugby league book and the soccer book he referred to as well, or football, whatever you whatever the appropriate expression is. And um, you know, he really he really writes very well and articulates his views um, excellently as well. But I think I, mean, I, I agree I, I agree with the the, the basic. Uh, thesis of what what um, 
origin means to Queenslanders as opposed to what it means to uh, New South Welsh, Welshmen. And um, it's, it's wrong to say it means more to Queenslanders than New South Welshmen. I think, it, I think it, it means as much to New South Welshmen, but it just means different things to New South Welshmen. And I think that one of the essential differences is caused by the fact that origin started when there were no NRL clubs in Queensland. And so the big thing that Queensland uh, children had when they were growing up, um, the biggest stage wasn't an NRL stage, it was a state of origin stage. And so um, culturally, they've, all, they've always grown up since origin started, aspiring to play only for, uh, for Queensland because they, they didn't necessarily aspire to play for an NRL team because most of them were Sydney-based. And conversely, Terry... Um, uh, I, I think I think a lot of uh, children that grow up in New South Wales have grown up with a principal loyalty being to their club as opposed to their state. You know, you're a Tigers fan or you're a Jets fan or you're um, a Seagulls fan or whatever, and you also you also like New South Wales, but your principal loyalty is to your club as opposed to your state. I think in um, in New South Wales, and I think that really informs why Queenslanders have a different view of origin to the view that a lot of a lot of New South Wales people um, have, but it's certainly certainly not the case that it that it doesn't mean as much to New South Wales people. It just means different things to New South Wales people, I think. Steve, what do you think about the, the tribalism in New South Wales as opposed to um, to uh, Queensland? Do you think, as Dave says, it, it is more club based? Oh, look, look, I think people are passionate about playing state of origin. There's no doubt about that in New South Wales. I mean, it was a fair wake-up call for us uh, when, it, when it first started and we saw the great Arthur Beetson go back to Queensland and Rod Reddy and Rod Morris and Greg Oliphant and all those sort of guys went back to play for Queensland where they were born. Um, it took us a, a fair while to wake up to ourselves, really. The first four series, um, Queensland had got ahead and then all of a sudden, um, the same sort of bloke as Arthur Beetson comes along. One's a, one's a front row and, one, and the greatest of all time, in my opinion. And then a bloke like Steve Mortimer came and taught New South Wales how to win. And it took, it took Steve Mortimer to take over as captain of New South Wales to really instill into a lot of young blokes uh, that, you know, this is, what, this is what it meant to him to win State of Origin. I, I think when you... When you look at it, and, and State of Origin's gone in different stages, when you look at, you know, the likes of Beetson and all that starting it off, and then along comes Chris Close and Wally Lewis and, and Greg Dowling and Gene Miles and, and all those sort of guys were all born around 10 months within each other. And when Arthur took over, young Chris Close and also Mal Meninga were only 20 or 21. And all of a sudden, they learnt what Origin was all about. And then they took over from Arthur. And as I mentioned, until we got that crop of players that were around about the same age and a leader, albeit a halfback in Steve Mortimer, to make us all realise what, uh, what state of origin was really all about. Of course, you set goals. You, you know, you, you come to your club and it was Balmain for me and then the next goal you set was to play for New South Wales. So, um, you know, I, look, I, I, I really disagree with they've got more passion in, you know, than we have. You know, obviously, you know, obviously, you know, we've heard, we've heard tonight there from from the guys that you know, Queens it means that much to them because we didn't they didn't have um, Sydney sides and all that to follow and it was all about Queensland. But look, we don't hear from them when New South Wales win two one or they win a series or we win three nil. What what happens to their passion then? Look, I've got no doubt that they have got plenty of passion about their Queensland jumper and all that sort of stuff, but. I can assure you, with all the blokes that I know that have played for New South Wales, uh, they love that sky blue jumper. It's also it's also interesting, Terry, to hear um, Joe make the observation that Queensland own the narrative about Origin. He's absolutely one hundred percent correct about that. They do own the narrative, uh, but they're also they're also having to change the narrative when, when it suits them. I mean, for instance, mm. Joe Joe made the point about the Terry Fernley rule. I mean, they changed that this year when the Australian coach becomes the, the Queensland uh, assistant coach, and the, you know the whole the whole philosophy of Origin is built on um, uh, Queensland is not having to play for New South Wales, but 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 playing for their own state in Queensland until until uh, you know Greg Inglis, who's who's a New South Wales guy who signs for <laughs> a Victorian club and has to go to Queensland because he's playing for the Victorian club, all of a sudden becomes a Queenslander. So. They, they, Joe's 100% right. They do own the narrative, but they, they're capable of changing the narrative. 
one of the points he makes in his book, uh, he didn't get to speak about it tonight, is the geography of Queensland and the fact that Brisbane's stuck right down the south near the, the Coid River, trying to get over here, I think. Um, but um, it's such a rural uh, society as compared to New South Wales because Sydney's stuck geographically pretty much on the middle of the eastern coastline and you've got big cities in Newcastle and Wollongong either mm. side of it. So uh, suburbia is a, a far bigger thing in New South Wales and growing up, Steve, in West Wollongong or even in his inner city, um, Dave, you know, like um, it, it's different. You, it's a different experience and in, in immersion into rugby league than that rural Queensland um, fairy tale. Yeah, look, I, I can understand everyone aspires to play for, for Queensland. Let's let's be let's be frank. There was a lot of people that, that didn't think it would work. I think it worked because of Arthur Beetson. I was uh, I was lucky enough to play in the under 18s before that game, and at Queensland for, for New South Wales up against Queensland, and we were lucky enough to um, to sit on the sideline. That, the crowd was that big that day that they sat all us young blokes on the on the sideline, and all of a sudden I see this. I see this monster run out with white powder and his both his fists are, are strapped. And I thought to myself, geez, look at this bloke. There was snot and everything coming out of his nose and his mouth and all that sort of stuff. And all of a sudden, you're right, he, he, he all, of, all of a sudden took on the New South Wales pack on his own. That's what it meant to Arthur Beetson. Now, let's not get anything mixed up here. If it wasn't for Arthur Beetson, I think, you know, the concept wouldn't be as good as it's been for 40 years. I'm not saying it wouldn't be still here. Of course it would be. But Arthur Beetson set the standard of how the game would play. And our captain too, Tom Redonikas. You would never, ever uh, get a more passionate man um, to lead New South Wales. And he's our, he's our godfather. So Queensland have got, Queensland have got Arthur Beetson and we've got, uh, we've got Tommy. <laughs> so I think, I think, Terry, just in relation, what you say is, is, is accurate in relation to the support. Um, the, 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 you know, the, the supporters have a different... Um, have a, have a slightly different cultural take on things, but it's not necessarily true of the players. I just saw somebody make the point, which is absolutely accurate, about the number of um, players who play for New South Wales who don't come from Sydney, but rather come from regional areas. Mm -hmm. And there's probably actually a predominance um, rather than a minority who come from, uh, who over the years have come from regional New South Wales. So, so the point, the point I, I certainly think is true of, of the support base in New South Wales, but it's not, not necessarily true of the... Um, the playing base. One of the points that uh, Joe made was that um, Origin's very much a unifying force um, for uh, for Queensland. Um, I think that's also the case in New South Wales, although, again, it probably plays out a little bit differently. Would you agree? I, th I, th I actually think it's the, the, the one thing and perhaps the only thing that unites the whole state. Um, so, so irrespective of your political views, your religious views, whether you're a sports nut, whether you don't have a view about sport, everyone has a view about origin. Everyone in New South Wales has a view about origin. And I, I firmly believe that it's the one thing, perhaps the only thing that unites our whole state. What do you think, Steve? Yeah, I, I, I've got to agree with Dave there. Look, everyone, everyone that I talk to about if you've been a player lucky enough to play for New South Wales, and there's been plenty of them too over the years, over the 40 years, uh, you talk to them about pride and that. They, mate, they love uh, the fact that they've played for New South Wales. I mean, of course, the ultimate goal is to play for Australia, but to play in a state of origin uh, in, a, in a game now that's been going for 40 years, and, you know, we saw, we saw the passion. You know, after the season that everyone's had this year, uh, origin won. I, I thought I thought it was a great contest. Unfortunately, New South Wales got beat at the end of the day. It didn't come out in the second half, but at halftime they could have been leading by twenty. So you know this this game too is going to be a beauty. Uh, I, look, I, I just I just think everyone you know and, and Dave's right too. You have a look at your family, even you know you know we, every person that you talk to when once state of origin's on. If I go back to Wollongong or go out into the country or what, everyone's talking about state of origin. And I reckon I reckon there'd be only a hard, handful of people, and they should be kicked out of the state too, by the way, that go for Queensland that were born in New South Wales. I can't believe that. If anyone ever tells me that, oh, that's that's nearly fighting words. <laughs> uh, you talk about the, the bush, um, Dave. Again, I'll bring you in here because I think you see that the unifying power through things like the Hogs of the Homeless and even um, earlier this year when uh, after the bushfires, I know Freddie and yourselves, you, you did quite a bit of work out in uh, some of those areas that were affected. Yeah, and it, so, so, I mean, in a, in a reverse way, I mean, Origin is so powerful in terms of um, 
the, you, using using the, um, the the reach that Origin gives you to do to do good things in the community. And um, if Freddie if Freddie's done uh, he's done a number you know plenty of things successfully, but the one thing he's done really successfully is to appreciate the power of Origin and and how much good that that can deliver um, to our community. And uh, as, as you say, he gets out. You know, I reckon once a month uh, he goes for two or three, gets on his Harley Davidson and goes for two or three days to a different regional area in New South Wales and um, and he's loved everywhere he, where he goes and everybody wants to have a piece of him and wants to have a piece of origin. One of the guys that goes with him, uh, Terry, is um, uh, Arthur Beetson's youngest son, Christian, who I think who I think might be uh, <coughs> listening in uh, tonight. So he's a... Um, people will, will probably... Um, um, not be happy with me for saying so, but he's a proud New South Welshman, as you know, Terry, as opposed to a proud <laughs> Queenslander. But they, but those guys, you know, Christian, Freddie, Ian Schubert, um, a few, uh, you know, Block's been on a couple of those, um, a couple of those trips. They do such um, wonderful things in, in our community using the power of origin. And what they do in New South Wales, mm. I know that the Queensland guys do exactly the same thing in Queensland. <clears throat> I think, you know. Every time there's an origin camp, I think one of the things that the Queenslanders do in the first or second day of their camp is they get out into regional Queensland and um, and spread the word both of footy but but of community goodwill as well. In in saying that too, you you know Freddie's infectious. He's that type of bloke. You've got to you've got to have those sort of leaders. I know he's a New South Wales coach and all that sort of stuff, but all you right. need a bloke that's that's willing to go out in those places and and do all that. You know, like. He's got a, a great sense of community, Freddie, and he, he loves getting out there and helping people. And he doesn't do it for notoriety. He doesn't do it for, for headlines in the paper. He doesn't need any of that. He's already, he's already had his career and had all that sort of stuff. But it, he's got this infectious in person, uh, personality that wants to help other people. And I reckon it's really important to, to have those sort of blokes that are in charge of, of um, you know, of footy sides. And what he can do is he can, I don't know if it's a word, but he, he can make his players hum, humble and, and understand that, you know, this is a gift given to you to play for New South Wales, but to go out there and, and give of yourself without expecting anything in return is a great thing. And, he, and Freddie, he does it enormously well. He does it better than anyone I've, I've ever seen. And, and just, you know, you would think that he had enough on his plate with Channel 9 and Coach and State of Origin and all the other stuff that he does. But to go out there and, and help people that are a little bit less fortunate than himself uh, is a great trade. He does a lot for the, uh, the Police Boys Club. Uh, I don't know if you know that. He does, does all sorts of work, going out and re-turfing re grounds in the country, you know, as we mentioned, the Hogs for Homeless. But uh, he's just a good fella. Um, last question to, to both of you before we uh, take a couple from the public. Um, uh, the point that um, Joe makes about the, the future and the changing demographics in state of origin with the, the rise of Pacifica peoples um, and the way they're dominating the game, you know, a lot of the, either Indigenous or Pacifica players uh, have um, come from that heritage these days. And how do you think that's going to play out in 10, 20 years' time? Well, I actually agree with Joe, um, Terry. I think it will... Uh, I mean, just just like just like Origin came came about as part of a sort of an evolution in the development of how you pick um, representative teams. I think inevitably um, the selection rules will be revisited, and um, and there'll be an evolution about qualification. Um, I think I think that the the, the concept about um, Pacifica uh, participation in in the thing is a little bit misunderstood at the moment because. Um, the dual qualification for the Pacific Island um, nations, um, there's, there's, there's nothing, there's no rule at the moment that prevents those players who have that dual qualification playing. Some of them that haven't played in recent times haven't played because what's happened, uh, Terry, in, in recent years is that Pacific <coughs> tests have been uh, scheduled on the same weekend, the, 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 the sort of free weekend with... Um, state of origin and um, what, what that's caused is it's forced players to make a, 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 you know, a, a choice between representing New South Wales or Queensland on the one hand and representing their Pacific nation of heritage on the other hand. Um, if the Pacific test was played on, on an alternative um, uh, date, then, um, then that choice wouldn't have to be made and I think that's the next step in the evolution so that, so that people don't have to make the choice. They can, they can um, 
they can play uh, for the New South Wales or Queensland and still have a you know a Pacific Heritage uh, nation that they can represent as well. Um, but but certainly with um, you know with the, with the significant increase in um, in uh, Pacifica players playing in the NRL, I think it's inevitable that um, that there will be qualification changes to um, to Origin, given that it's the you know the biggest thing on our on our stage at the moment. I just I, I just wonder a bloke like Andrew Fafita, and good on you. You know you've got your you've got your right to make decisions that you want to. Um, and mate, I thought he was a great player for New South Wales and all that sort of stuff, and then and went over and, and played for his Pacific nation. Uh, I wonder whether he would have done that had he not played for New South Wales or had he been picked for New South Wales the first time. I wonder what sort of, um, what sort of choice he would have made then or what sort of choices um, the Pacific Island players would make if they're born in Queensland or New South Wales, whether they make the choice of wanting to play for, for New South Wales first or if they play, I think, I think Andrew Fafita played something like 15 Origins or something like that, around about that number. I just wonder... I just wonder would he have made the same decision had it been his first origin. Okay. Yeah. Um, thanks very much for your, your thoughts there, gentlemen. I've got a couple of questions from the um, members of the public who are watching. First one comes from David Hunter. Um, he wants to know your thoughts on a pause in the NRL season to play State of Origin on three consecutive weekends in the middle of the year um, rather than at the end of the year. I suppose this year is still a work in progress, but uh, David might ask you first. Uh, I think it's unlikely, Terry, um, for a couple of reasons. I think um, commercially, from a broadcaster's point of view and from other commercial partners in the game, they, they prefer it to be um, spaced out a little bit. Um, I think it's also a huge strain on the players. I mean, I, I, saw, um, I saw one of our guys quoted, I think it might have been Josh Adokar, mm. quoted as saying um, it was like playing four grand finals uh, mm. in a month. And... I mean, the state of origin, Block will tell you better than me, but the state of origin games take uh, such a physical toll but, but also such a mental toll on players. I think it's an enormous ask of them to, um, to play three origin games in three weeks. And, I, and I, um, I think it's probably unlikely to happen. Steve? Oh, oh, look, I think it's too much too. I mean, you know, we've, got to, we've always got to think about the players' safety. You know, they've just played 20 odd rounds and then semi-finals and grand final and then you know to put them week in and week out for three games in a row I, I think it's a big ask it's tough we've already seen we've already seen a number of players pull out before the start of the state of origin and now we're seeing a number of injuries after the first one so I think it's going to be even worse I hate to say it after the second game and then you know it'll be <laughs> it'll be the war of attrition too for the third game you know hopefully hopefully it's a decider up there but the players the players obviously are going to give their all, no doubt about that, and they want to play state of origin. But I don't, I don't know where it really fits. I don't know whether you can stop the the premiership, um, you know, because that's you know that's what everyone wants to watch. But they also want to watch the origin too. So I, I don't really know the answer. That's probably why I'm doing what I'm doing and not in Dave's shoes. <laughs> um, we've got another question here from Jeff Gabriel, RE uh, Steve Mascord's reference of Queensland being the Harlem Globetrotters and New South Wales being the Washington Generals. He says, could this dynamic change, especially if Queensland goes an extra NRL franchise or New South Wales goes on an eight-year winning streak? Yeah, well, I, think, I think the days of the eight-year winning streaks are probably... Um, uh, I'm not sure that that'll happen uh, any time soon. I mean, the, that, was, uh, that, 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 that generation of players, Terry, was such a, uh, a unique generation of players and, uh, you know, that they all come together at the same time. Um, and 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 all all finish up in the same team. Uh, uh, as I said, is a really unique thing. So I don't. I, I, Origin games are always really close. You know, even in that run of eight, you know, there were most of the games were sort of two points here or three points there or whatever, and could have gone either way. And it's they're always such tight contests, and the teams are so evenly matched. Uh, you know, last Wednesday was a great example of that. I, I think. Um, the styles will always be reasonably similar. The um, the results will always be very very close as well. So um, yeah, it, it's just and that's the magic of the the, the contest, isn't it? I mean, the, the biggest attraction is that is that um, everybody knows they go to an Origin game uh, with the result uncertain, and um, and and you know you, you cheer for your team and your team's a big chance of uh, being successful 
no matter how the Queensland teams are going in the Premiership at it, you know, a particular time or the New South Wales teams. Yeah, I don't, I don't think we're ever going to see a run like that again. You know, when you when you have a look at it, we talk about generational plays, but I, players, I, I reckon that I reckon Cronk and Smith and, and Slater and all those sort of guys, Inglis, were probably once in a lifetime players. You'd have to go right back to, you know, probably the start of the eighties when you you know when you had those guys as I was mentioning before, in Gene Miles and and uh, and all those sort of guys with Wally Lewis and uh, you know. Greg Dowling, and they were all born within that same sort of range. And I, I think the same thing happened when that, when that great run for Queensland happened. Uh, we've won the last two, by the way. I hope everyone uh, realises that. And we're, we're one behind in this series. We could win the, we could win the series and, and be, you know, three in a row. Had, I, I just would like to ask the question too. Had New South Wales won eight in a row, if we had a run like that, would State of Origin still be going? You know, so... You know, hopefully, uh, you know, hopefully we can answer that question when we win another five series in a row. <laughs> I can tell you the answer block. They would have changed the rules. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> and probably legend to the next question that I've received here from Max Easton. How is the identity Queensland built by origin seen by people in other non-rugby league states, I suppose? I think, I think it's funny too, you know. Look, everyone I talk to in, in Melbourne, if they're not related to me, uh, they all go for Queensland. So I think that's... There's a little bit of a, a little bit of bullying going on against the, the New South Welshmen all the time. I don't know I don't know why, but they they seem to like all the, the Melburnians like to see the the underdog win. I would I would say, so uh, yeah, it's it, it's interesting. Yeah, you, know, you get a whole mix of people. It depends who you're talking to and depend who they are talking to. Because a lot of people say if they're talking to me, they go for New South Wales. So if they were talking <laughs> to Mel Meninga, they'd be saying Queensland. But you know, it's uh, yeah, it's I, I reckon. I reckon it's a pretty even mix. I reckon, uh, I reckon if you if you took the took the notes and mate, you, what you got to realise too, I think David would probably be able to correct me here. I think it's seen in 130 countries now. I think it's that big that uh, you know we're not we're not only talking about we're, we're talking about a like a worldwide uh, contest that, that that we see all the time now when State of Origin comes around. The uh, when we go to these other cities, you know Adelaide, Perth, Melbourne, whatever Terry they. Um... It's, it's, I reckon it's just like a, um, another home game for Queensland because they all seem to dislike people from New South Wales more than they dislike people from Queensland. <laughs> we know Victoria in the series. <laughs> yeah. Um, a comment by Max Hussey on the contrasting styles of play it, or what used to be different styles of play in both teams. He says it now seems to have changed and both states play the same way. And uh, Now it relies on pre-game hype rather than ten, well, tangible appeal. I don't know if I'd agree with that. Oh no, mate! Oh, you know, even even you know, with it's always been all about possession and completions and all that sort of stuff. The the new rule that come in this year with the with the six again, although taxing on the middlemen and the blokes who play in the front row and and you know play in that middle, um, how taxing it is for them now. I reckon it's one of the best rules to be brought in, and uh, you know you can't all of a sudden make all these changes and expect people to play different ways, but. It goes on your personnel. The, the type of players that you've got in your football side generally dictates to the way you're going to play. So, you know, if New South Wales had, you know, for example, uh, some, oh, not the, they need better attacking players, but if they did in different positions, they'd probably play a different way. Same as Queensland. I totally agree with, with Block. I mean, the style is very dependent on the personnel and it's also dependent on the on the, on the coach and the, the coach's personality too, so I don't I don't I don't think there's any unique any style that's unique to either Queensland or New South Wales. I think, as Block said, depends on very much very much on the personnel in the team. Yeah, and you certainly see the skill level of the modern players across the board. You know, in the NRL and, and Origin and every other level, um, mm. it's a different game than it was when you were playing, Steve. I mean, I, you know, I've got admiration for these guys now. You know, like it, it's it's funny you should say that. You know. Some of these guys playing now are my heroes, you know what I mean? I haven't played for, for a long, long time, but uh, no, I admire what they did, you know. It's horses for courses, you know. You, you, you do what you've got to do and, you know, the game's going to evolve again. There's no doubt about that, you know. But, you know, these guys, uh, they're great athletes. Um, you know, when I was playing, if they yelled out winger in, it was, a, it was my chance to try and bash a winger, wasn't it? You know, until Eric Graith come along, you know what I mean? The big, strong winger and all these guys are so good at the back end of the field and, you know, I've got nothing but admiration for, for every guy that plays now. And, uh, you know, to, to get yourself uh, into the physical condition that they're in and get yourself to play well week in and week out, it's, uh, it's, it's not an easy way to make a living, I can tell you. 
Um, final thoughts, uh, gentlemen. Um, I, I'd just like, I suppose, before I wrap up, um, to point out something that's very special about State of Origin in that uh, no other sport really has anything like that. Rugby league is unique in being able to provide um, an inter- domestic level representative competition or contest that just attracts so much interest and it's the envy of other sports. And it's, as you said, Steve, it's a worldwide phenomenon. Um, and it's something very special on both sides of the Tweed River. And um, as much as we hate each other, I think we're very lucky to share it um, as rugby league people. Yeah, well, mate, you know, Queensland always going on about how, you know, they're more passionate and everything. Who are they going to play if they don't play us? You can't play against yourself, can you? <laughs> they need someone to hate. We need someone to hate. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. They'd have nothing to whinge about. <laughs> we actually, we, um, we, uh, the New South Wales Rugby League, Terry, gets on really well with the Queensland Rugby League. We've got so much in common and uh, they're full of really good guys. But we, as we do hate them, but we only hate them three days a year. Yeah. So we, say, we save it all up for three days a year. <laughs> well, thanks, Steve and Dave, very much for your time this evening. Um, I'd also like to thank our, um, Michael uh, Carr, uh, sorry, Michael Adams and Andy Carr, uh, our uh, Tom Brock committee members who have uh, done all the technical stuff for tonight um, and managed all the difficulties. So uh, I think it's been very worthwhile from what I can see. Um, thanks very much. Uh, if anyone wants to learn more about the Tom Brock Bequest Committee, go to the Tom Brock website, just Google that. Um, we've got social media presence too uh, via Facebook, Twitter, etc. So thanks again, gentlemen. Hopefully the Blues can uh, balance the ledger on uh, Wednesday night. We go up uh, north for a decider. Good, Good on you, Terry. Thanks, Good mate. on you. Thanks See very you much. Mate. See you, Mark. See you, mate.